So today we got a special treat. Um, last week we had uh, Don Vanderhoff, uh, Pastor Mez, uh, um, and uh, he was going to have a heart valve replacement, serious operation, heart valve replacement. And we brought him up and we all gathered around him and laid hands on him and prayed for him. So our blessing today is Pastor Don is going to read scripture for us today. Come on up, Pastor Don. God certainly is good and God does answer prayer. I appreciate it so much. The uh, prayers of this congregation last Sunday for me. We went into the hospital on Monday morning at 5.15, and by 10 o'clock, the valve had been replaced, and uh, I was uh, probably in recovery at that time. Uh, during the afternoon, I relaxed a bit in bed, followed their instructions, uh, stayed one night, and they sent me home Tuesday afternoon. Uh, I'm feeling well, and uh, my strength is returning, my voice is returning, um, and um, my wife says I'm looking good. I'm not sure how I'm acting, but I'm looking pretty good. <laughs> so thank you so much, and thank God always for his uh, faithfulness to us. The scripture lesson this morning is Jeremiah chapter 1, verses 1 through 10. This is the call of Jeremiah to a life of uh, prophecy to the nation of Judah. Uh, so um, listen to the call of Jeremiah as it's recorded in his book, chapter 1, verses 1 through 10. The words of Jeremiah, son of Hilkiah, one of the priests of Anathoth in the territory of Benjamin. The word of the Lord came to him in the thirteenth year of the reign of Josiah, son of Ammon, king of Judah, and through the reign of Jehoiakim, son of Josiah, king of Judah, down to the fifth month of the eleventh year of Zedekiah, son of Josiah, king of Judah, when the people of Jerusalem went into exile. The word of the Lord came to me saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. Ah, sovereign Lord, I said, I do not know how to speak. I am only a child. But the Lord said to me, do not say, I am only a child. You must go to everyone I send you and say whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you and will rescue you, declares the Lord. Then the Lord reached out his hand and touched my mouth and said to me, now I have put my words in your mouth. See, today I appoint you over nations and kingdoms to uproot and to tear down, to destroy and overthrow, to build and to plant. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. At this time, we're going to ask uh, that the children would be dismissed to Children's Church. Thank you, Don, for the reading of that scripture for us and bringing God's word to us in that way. Um, it's a pleasure to have you here with us today. So today's scripture, it goes into this, um, it starts off with the idea that God is calling a prophet. God is calling someone for a particular purpose and job. So a little background on uh, Jeremiah and what's going on during this uh, scripture that was read today. See, after the death of King Solomon in 930 BC, what we see is a total uh, uh, degrade 
of the people of Israel. It's, it's so bad that the whole nation splits in half. It doesn't talk about a civil war, but I'm pretty sure it was that bad to where they split in half. And the northern section kept the name Israel. And the southern section was then referred to as Judah, like the tribe of Judah, because most of the people in that region were from the tribe of Judah. And what happened as uh, David died and then Solomon came into power and he started off good, but we kind of read in scripture where a few uh, sketchy things were done by Solomon towards the end of his life to the point then that now the kingdom has been torn asunder. It's been pulled apart. And as the kingdom comes apart, what happens is that the people begin to seek other things. They start to put other things first in their lives. What the Bible refers to as worshiping idols, things made by human hands of wood, of, of metal. You know, if it was today's modern days, it would be plastic, right? And so they're worshiping these things. And instead of worshiping the true God, the God that actually brought them out of Egypt, out of slavery. The God that embraced them. I mean, we see throughout this book of Jeremiah as, as um, he speaks of the people of Israel is, is almost this love, a, a broken heart from love, right? A lovesick, I guess you would say. He's, he's, you know, I, I knew you as, as a young maiden, he says. You chased after me in the wilderness. And I took you by the hand and all this kind of speech. And now they turn from God. And so God sends prophets to Israel. And he sends prophets to Judah. Because if they're split up, but as far as he's concerned, they're still his people. They're still one people. And he sends this message to the prophets. The prophets bring it to Israel. They don't listen. So, so what happens is that now rising up is the Babylon op uh, Empire. And they come in and they take Israel captive. They take the people out and take them captive. And Judah's like, oh, well, they didn't touch us, so we must be good with God, right? We must be living right. But God then calls Jeremiah to bring to them this message of correction, also a message of love, a message of hope, and a message of a future for them. But again, Judah doesn't listen to the voice of God. They don't turn. They keep going in their rebellious ways. And so then eventually Babylon again comes and takes the people of Judah as um, captives. And drags them out of the land. Now, God calls this very young man for a specific purpose. But they don't listen. And so today's scripture is more or less going to concentrate on the calling of Jeremiah. And even more than that, it's going to be concentrated on the very first verse. That's just a little synopsis, a background on what's going on in Israel, in Judah, when God calls Jeremiah. Now, we read the scripture and we see that Jeremiah puts the excuse that he's young. So Jeremiah couldn't have been more than, than maybe a, a young teen or, or a teenager when God was calling him for this post of prophet to the people. He's like, I'm young. They're not going to listen to me. I mean, if you look at the Jewish culture, at the age of 13, it's what the, a young man or a young Jewish man will get a bar mitzvah. A bar mitzvah is the welcoming of this young man into manhood. So the idea that this, Jeremiah says, I'm young, he was probably somewhere in his teens when God is calling him to be a mouthpiece for his word.
But I'm going to just jump around today and I want to concentrate on some of the phrases that are in this very first verse. I want to concentrate on the eyes of this verse. And I'm not talking about these eyes, right? I'm talking about like the I will do this, right? Let's concentrate on some of the eyes. So the very first eye we see is the word, the, uh, the eye that says, I formed you. He says, I formed you. Now, um, in our nation, there's a big upheaval. There's been this fight, this struggle for years now when it comes to abortion. And some use this verse as a means of, of explaining abortion. But yet, I've heard the other side. I've heard ministers from mainstream American religions who have made the argument that this is not about abortion. God does not mention abortion here. And um, I formed you. He's not mentioning anything like that. He was talking to Jeremiah. He's not talking to anybody else. Now, we make that mistake a lot, don't we? That unless the, we see where the Bible says, thou shalt not, we think we could get away with it. What we fail to see is that we need to recognize God's character. God's character. You see, uh, the Bible doesn't have to tell me thou shalt not. But if I read the Bible and learn God's character, I know what pleases God and what doesn't please God. Does that make sense? It's almost like a loophole type thing. We're looking for loopholes, right? Well, I mean, it says thou shalt not steal, so I don't steal. You know, but the Bible doesn't say um, Thou shalt not drink poison, or thou shalt not smoke poison, or thou shalt not eat poison. But yet it tells us what? That it te God tells us that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Woe unto him who destroys the temple of God. See, so it doesn't have to say thou shalt not eat bad food. But we know God's character, that he wants us to take care of ourselves and this temple that he lives in. Does that make sense? And so the idea that people say, well, you know, God's not talking to us. He, he's not talking about abortion. He's talking to Jeremiah. But listen, let me just put it this way. Let's, let's, let's have a biblical reasoning here. Let, I, I got to take it from a biblical uh, aspect because um, these are folks from mainstream religions that are saying this. And so I need to, to, to lean on the Bible to make my point. My point is a long point. Here it goes. Who created life? Who created life? Who created life? God. God created life, so it makes sense that he is concerned for every living thing, even the unborn who are Formed in his image. Where's the argument? John chapter 10 verse 10 tells us, A thief comes only to rob, kill, and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. See, God is about life. God offers life. God offers life to the living and not murdering. It tells us that the thief comes to kill and destroy. The thief is a nickname for whom? Satan. So it's the devil that kills and destroys. And we need to understand that. We need to understand and know God's character that when he says I formed you it's that he had an involvement in the life of every one of us you know when God tells Jeremiah I formed you this is something we can also apply to our own lives oh he was just talking no we could apply that to our lives it confirms to us that God cares for us it confirms to us that God loves us it confirms to us that God would send his only son for us we matter to God so 
We see also this word form, right? When God says, I formed you. We also see the same word, the same Hebrew word used where? In Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, where it says, Then the Lord formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living thing. So who gave life? God. And he did it how? By doing what to man? Forming him. His hands are involved in our lives. We see also that um, this term form is used in pottery, pottery working. A potter, a potter does what with his hands? He forms things, right? He makes a vase. <laughs> Funny story. In junior high school, we had this thing which kids today are so deprived from. We had this thing called shop. How many of you remember shop <laughs> in school, right? You made things with your hands. You went to school and they taught you how to make things. And one of the shop classes was pottery. And so um, I made this great mug, like a stein, a beer stein type thing, right? Big, with a big handle. And I was going to take that home and give it to my mom. But they had to be kilned. They had to be baked first so, to harden up. Well, when they put mine in the kiln, it was so thick that it blew up. <laughs> and so much for my pottery career. That was it. <laughs> I never wanted to do pottery after that. Uh, and it's funny that back then they'd say, oh, make an ashtray for your mother and your father. I don't think they would tell kids that today and day, right? Make an ashtray for your mother and father. <laughs> um, but the idea is the same, that it's formed with the hands. The hands are involved, and God's hands are involved in each and every life in this world. I believe that. We get that from a simple verse. I formed you. The second I, because there's three I's in this verse, the second I is this in this text, I knew you. Well, we could also say, I know you, or I knew you. So we serve an all-knowing God, right? He knows all things. There's, there's, there's a big uh, uh, um, theological word for that. It's called omniscient, right? God is omniscient. He knows all things, right? It kills me when people come and, 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 and tell me things and, and think they're getting away with something. And forget that God is omniscient. He knows all things. Let's be clear and open with each other because God knows all things. I'm trying to be discreet when I say these stories because I don't want to mention uh, uh, what the situation is or names or anything like that. But people come and they tell you stuff and, and you're sitting there and you're saying to yourself, you know, you're lying to me, you're lying to God. God knows all things, you know. I don't know, I've been cursed with the gift of discernment, and I could usually tell when someone's not being truthful to me. But God is omniscient. He knows all things. And so prior to Jeremiah's birth, God says, I knew you. I formed you, and I knew you. This is the idea that things are set apart. Things are set aside. There are theological words for that. It's called consecration. It's called holiness. Right? Consecration. Uh, I know it's not Communion Sunday, but one of the examples would be like when we have communion, right? It's just a wafer, a dried out wafer or a piece of bread. It's just juice or a little bit of wine. It's, it's just something commercial. But when we take it and we read that part that Jesus says, on the night I was betrayed, we're taking and separating it. We're consecrating it. 
We're making it holy for a specific reason. Now, let me get a little deeper into that. I got this blue mug at home. It was given to me years ago by a friend who passed away. It was actually a raffle, but she made sure I won that mug. I think, I think it was fixed. The raffle was fixed. <laughs> I won the mug and a uh, uh, Passion of, of Christ video, <laughs> DVD. Anyway, but she, I knew what she had done. She wanted me to have this mug that had the word friend. And it had it in multiple languages. It has it all around. I mean, I, I should have took a picture and showed it to you. But that's my mug. That's the mug I drink my coffee in. And God forbid you come to my house and grab my mug. Because there are plenty of other mugs in that cabinet. Leave my mug alone. I got a witness. It's set apart. It's consecrated. For a specific purpose. It's holy. As far as I'm concerned. So you understand this idea of, of be, before I formed you, I knew you. See, it's set apart. And Jeremiah was set apart for God. And you and I are set apart for God as we give our hearts to Jesus Christ. In the Bible, it talks about setting things apart. Right. Or, or keeping them holy. What's one of the examples we see about keeping something holy in Exodus chapter 16? What's it say there? Come on. Some of you Bible scholars here. Keep the Sabbath holy. Right. Keep the Sabbath holy. What's that mean? Keep it separate. Keep it set apart. Keep it dedicated for something. Now, I know the argument has gone through the years that Christians don't celebrate the Sabbath. The Sabbath is a Saturday. But because the apostles, taking Jesus' teaching that this was the new covenant, went from celebrating or keeping the Sabbath to making the first day of the week, which is Sunday, the day that Jesus rose from the dead, the special day where Christians unite together to celebrate their salvation. So we move from keeping a Saturday holy to now setting apart a Sunday. Of making it special. Now, I know there's many arguments about, you could go very legalistic with this. I've known people that have taken this to the extreme, where they won't even cook on a Sunday. You know, and I think that's taking it to the extreme. I'm not being judgmental, I'm just saying they're taking it to the extreme. The, the, the idea of the Sabbath it's, is for Christians to set out a time, a, a slot in our busy, busy, busy schedules to get together as God's people and have some time together where we worship God, where we testify to each other, where we enjoy each other's company, where we allow the Spirit to move among us, where we could pray for one another, where we could see healings and transformations and miracles happen before our eyes here on earth. So we could get into that argument and again be legalistic about it, but, but listen, let me just... Listen very closely. Let me just wrap it down to this. God created families. I believe that with all my heart. And they're special. But there is no way that God intended for your family to take his place in your life. God created marriages. God created the very first marriage. He created men and women and he presented um, um, Eve to Adam. Adam flipped backwards and he performed the first wedding. God did. So God loves your marriage. But there is no way that God wants your marriage to ever take the place that he holds in your heart. God wants us to work and support our families. 
God wants us to earn a living if we can. But there is no way that God ever intended that your job or your career would take up his time that's supposed to be set apart for him. Now, some may say, Pastor Joe, that's kind of old-fashioned thinking. No, it's just what the Bible tells us. That there are things that are set aside, things that are special, slots in our busy schedule that we could say, yes, this is a special time. That's all. It's a special time for God. We need to set things apart for God. And then we need not to take them back. I knew you. God knows us. He knows our hearts. He knows our intents. And he wants us to hold the relationship we have with him. We, he wants us to have that set apart for it to be special. He wants to make us holy. You know, this idea of knowing someone. I could say I know someone. It's like I could say, well, I know Elvis. I've heard of Elvis. I've heard of his songs. You know, they just made a movie of Elvis again. I know of Elvis. But do I really know Elvis? Did I hang out with him? Did, did I see what he does during the day? Did I speak with him? No. So this whole idea in the Hebrew verb of knew or know is different. It's not a mental knowledge. It's a, um, an intimate knowledge. This week, Lillian and I celebrated our 44th wedding anniversary. Now, I know for some of you guys, you're like, oh, those young whippersnappers. <laughs> but that means that I know her. I know her likes. I know, I'm not talking about intimacy. I'm not talking about sex or anything like that. I'm talking about I know her. I know her likes. Sometimes we finish each other's sentences. That's the kind of no that God is talking about when it comes to you. He knows you that way. He knows you in a loving way. That no matter what else in your life is happening, he's going to be there for you. He's going to comfort you. He's going to be by your side. He's never going to let your hand go. I know you, he says. And the third point, or the third I in here is, I appointed you. God called Jeremiah. And when Jeremiah heard God's voice, what did he say? Did he say, oh Lord, yeah, I'm ready to go. See, God says, before you were formed, I knew you and I appointed you. But Jeremiah's answer was, oh, sovereign Lord. I can't speak for you. I'm nothing but a young youth, he says in verse 6. Jeremiah felt inadequate. He felt unqualified, unexperienced. Do we feel that way sometimes? I mean, we hear Pastor Joe, all these messages, oh, share your faith. Share your testimony. But Pastor Joe, that's not me. I just... It doesn't come from me. I can't, I can't speak those kind of things. And it's not me. <laughs> but the Lord assured Jeremiah this. He said, I will be with you. All he told Jeremiah was to be faithful. He said, do not be afraid, declares the Lord, for I am with you. To deliver you. See, all God wants from those that he has appointed is faithfulness. Faithfulness. We may not know how to do something. But our faithfulness needs to stand back and say, God, I don't know how to do this. But if you help me, I will. God, I don't know how to do this, but if you help me, I will. Could you say that with me? God, 
I don't know how to do this, but if you help me, I will. That was my prayer during this whole building project. I never built anything like this in my life or, or, or headed it or spearheaded it. But I knew that God had an appointment for me to do this. And it kept me up at night. And my prayer was, God, I don't know how to do this thing. But if you help me, I will. I will. Don't ever say God can't use you. Don't ever think that God can't put words in your mouth. He tells us just open your mouth. Be faithful. I'll put the words you need in them or in it. I appointed you, the Bible tells us. You know, for many years, I ran from my calling. I ran from the idea of being a pastor. I put every excuse in the book out there before God. Just like Moses, when Moses was called to deliver the people of Israel from bondage, the first thing Moses said, Lord, I can't. I don't know how to speak right. God said, I'll find somebody to speak for you. Oh, Lord, I can't. I utter, I stutter, I mutter. I can't do this thing. And then finally, almost like Moses is saying, just go find somebody else. And that was my attitude for years running from the appointment that God had in my life. I had people speak into my life. People I never knew before say things like, you have a calling on your life. God wants you to be a pastor. I would say, get out of here. See, I grew up the son of two pastors. My mom and my dad. My mom probably more than my dad. <laughs> and I saw what they went through in the church and how they were treated and the suffering that they went through in the hands of other people that called themselves Christians. And I was like, I don't want any part of that. As a matter of fact, when um, Lillian, when we moved to Pennsylvania and Lillian started looking for a church to go to because she felt from the Lord that she needed to take the kids to a place where the Bible was taught. I told her, you do what you need to do. I don't want any part to do with those hypocrites. Those were my words. And then when the pastor of the church that she finally found told her, would you like me to go home to your home and speak to your husband to see maybe we could get him to come? I told him, if you ever come to my doorstep, I will throw a bucket of hot water on you. And little did I know that that man was not scared by that. He would go to my place of work without me knowing, not being making an, a, 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 you know, a, a big rumpus or anything like that, but just outside or, or on the other room, he would start praying over me and praying over my family to the point that when we came to a major crisis, like finding out my daughter was going to die, my heart was broken and reassembled in the hands of God. And that's when I started saying, God, I don't know how to do this, but if you help me, I will. And after God chasing me all those years, he pulled a fast one on me. He called me to lead worship at Beaumont Church. We came out here to lead worship. The pastor that they had quit and left the congregation hanging. And my, supervi uh, my superintendent said, Joe, I need you to take over. The old... What do you call that? Slide a hand. <laughs> but let me tell you something. This was God's appointment for me. And I ran from it most of my life. But as I come off of my sabbatical, this is the greatest blessing in my life. 
to share my life with this congregation, to feel the love that you guys have toward me. It's humbled my heart. God has an appointment for each and every one of us, my friends. We need to open our mouths. This world is going to hell in a handbasket. You know, coming off of this COVID, and we're not even coming off of it because I got a call from my son in California. Him, his two children, and his wife just went through COVID. So this thing is still fresh. And um, the thing about COVID is this, and we've lost a lot of loved ones. Even in this church, we lost loved ones to this horrible COVID. But as the years go by, I'm seeing that there's a greater damage done. There's a greater damage done to our mental health and to our emotions. I see it all around. As a matter of fact, there was a report this week that right now there are more traffic accidents than they were before COVID. I guess after being locked up for two years, you forget how to drive. But it's because of the attitude. People are coming off of this COVID thing with this nasty attitude where they cut people off. They fight on lines. The other day, an attraction in Disney World, the happiest place in the world, had to be closed because a family started fighting with another family because of standing on line. The biggest damage of this COVID is being done to our psyche, my friends. And we as Christians have to tell this dying world that there is still hope. And we have to be able to tell this world that there's still a God that loves them. Amen. We have to open our mouths and let people know that there is salvation still in Jesus Christ our Lord. I appointed you to go into this dying world and share your testimony and your love with them. This is what God says. I appointed you. I believe that. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you, and we thank you, and we thank you that you know us, you formed us, you made us, you've given each of us the gifts that we have, the talents. Help us, Lord, to use those gifts and talents for your honor, for your glory, for this kingdom that is to come. Help us, Lord, to understand that you call us, you appoint us, and you expect us to be faithful to you. I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand and sing our closing song.